Hi, everyone. Welcome to Real Food Recovery, episode 20. Hello, Jamie. Hi, Paige. How are you doing? Good. Nice to see you. You too. You too. I'm happy that we are here today. Episode 20. Can't believe episode 20. This is a milestone episode for us. I know. Uh, you're in the uh, this the, the second round of our of our episodes that talk a little bit more in detail about topics that are not related specifically to our tree of life, um, but are definitely related to um, to topics that we hear in the in the media on a regular yeah. basis around nutrition's impact on the aging brain. Mm-hmm. Just before Paige, I just want to um, turn it over to you, but I want to remind our listeners that we are food plan neutral and processed food free at real food recovery. We don't care the the plan so much as long as it is processed food free. Uh, That's something that is really, really important to us. Um, But we do have some, some guidelines around nutrition today. Yeah. And uh, Paige, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. This is actually a very interesting topic because Again, we're talking about nutrition's impact on the aging brain. And this is going to be a little bit more of a science heavy episode towards the end, but stick with us because I think this is going to be really vital information. So one of the things I want to start out with asking is, did you know that there are little factories inside each one of our cells? Did you know that every bite you take is ledger to the good or the bad? It's kind of like Santa's list, right? (laughs) That's what I used to tell my kids. You want to get on Santa's list, you know, you got to do good stuff. So he, he keeps a tally. It's the same way in our cells with every bite of food that, that we take. So Mm -hmm. what we are learning is that the impact of what we eat now affects us deeply on a cellular level. So much so that every bite of processed food increases cellular aging while every bite of single ingredient food actually slows down cellular aging and encourages cell repair. What we eat today shows up many years down the road. Right now is when we need to concern ourselves with the impact that nutrition has on our long-term cognition. Mm -hmm. Food should really be viewed in the same way that we view drugs. They interact with many brain processes and alter how we think and feel. Did you know that your brain cannot tell the difference between a highly processed, ultra-processed food and a drug, literally it is recognized in the same part of the brain. We know we have two major parts of the brain, the frontal lobe up between the eyeballs, and Mm -hmm. then the center brain up at the back of the brain. That's where all of our addictions are housed. That's where addictions are are, there are recognized food, drugs, alcohol, sex, shopping, all those things that that part of the brain would not know the difference between if you're eating a cookie or if you're taking heroin, that that's how dramatically impactful these highly processed foods are on uh, that part of the brain. So can we talk about how quickly, how quickly sugar registers? Yes. Yes. How how long does it take for sugar to register from the tongue to the brain? A fraction of a second, a less than a second. Cocaine, I think takes 10 minutes, literally, let's just call it tongue to brain. It's that powerful, 10 times more addictive than cocaine. Yes. And because in, in they measure addictive addictiveness in this, in this example, guys, they're measuring addictiveness in the speed of processing. So when they talk about how addictive something is, it is the speed of processing for hit from, from the, when it makes contact with the bloodstream or, or the saliva in this case to, to the brain, it is literally less than a second mm-hmm. and faster than cocaine. And that there is so much research around the reason that, you know, for me, I know it makes a lot of sense when I would eat sugar or eat, you know, processed sugar, um, what baked goods, anything like that, it would be like a slot machine going off in my head. (laughs) And I couldn't, it was like, I, I would get this immediate buzz and this immediate bells and whistles would, would ding and ring. And I would just feel so different. And mm-hmm. I remember thinking, this is amazing, but this isn't right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then you wanted it more and more and more because you're looking for that, that same, that same response. That is the addiction in action. Yeah. Lab rats will choose sugar over cocaine every yes. single time. 
So let's, you know, do we know people who have been altered by processed food? I mean, my gosh, I think both of us have a slew of answers on that. I'll give an, uh, a story about myself. This past Mother's Day, which was not very long ago, um, we were at my daughter's house. I had a plan before I ever went to the event. I made sure I'd eaten enough before I'd went. I had my water. I planned on being calm once I got there. And in that environment, there were these salty snacks everywhere before the meal. And I made the mistake in the moment, in the heat of the moment, I took one bite. And this was the first time this ever has ever happened to me. I literally felt the shift from playing with the grandkids to how can I get more bites of that? My brain was on fire and it was driving me to get more at any cost, but yet I need to remain cool in front of everybody all at the same time. So we know that when we take our first bite, our brains lose the ability to govern with reason. It then shifts to being governed by the pleasure pain balance. And I lost that one that day, although I didn't go back four seconds of the meal and I was done eating for the day after we got home. I was proud to be able to, to cut it off and lot, lot, not let it carry over once we got back home and just got right back on track after that. And I didn't indulge in the dessert, but I literally felt that shift from being connected with people to connected to the food. I could, I, the, 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 the importance of people just dropped dramatically. Yeah. And I, yeah. all, I had one, I had a mission to mm -hmm. get back to that bag and get more of the salty snacky stuff. And I'm like, Oh, I had a plan and everything, but it's, it's level of awareness. Well, can we talk about why I think that is right? Be, you know, in, in my, oh, in my yeah. experience, it's of course it's the chemical response in the brain, but, but when we look at what's in the food, right. When you talk about salty snacks, salty snacks are, if they're processed and in a bag or a box and marketed, they are typically not just, you know, a, a maybe wheat based or, or grain based. They're usually, they usually have sugar oil and the, the starch component in there as well. So it's that trifecta of the sweet, salty, oily. Yeah. It, it is a, a miniature version yeah. of, of a donut, so to speak in the sense the way, yeah. the way that it, it, our bodies react to that, those processing those processed parts and ingredients. So yes. it's not just that it's one thing or that it's the salt or that it's, it, it's, or it's the hand to mouth. It's all of it. It's mm -hmm. all of it. And I will find, you know, there was a, I told about in a prior episode where I had, I had um, wraps that I had bought thinking that they, I, there are these minimal ingredient wraps that I will buy. And when I'm in a, on a, a travel day and I will have them and they never, I never even, they never trigger me. They're like, you know, they're, they're like made with like a mortar and pestle kind of thing. Like it's really simple. And I ended up buying another kind thinking that they were the same, that they were, you know, flaxseed and chia and that they were done. They're not, they had, they had flour in them, mm. wheat flour in them. Mm. And I, I was like, as soon as I had one, I was like, where's another, I need to have another one of those wraps. Like why <laughs> can't I stop thinking of these wraps? And so the good news is TSA took care of it and got rid of them. But the point is that I was like, I noticed that I was different mm -hmm. with than I have been when I've traveled before with this other brand. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's a minimally processed thing that I, you know, good, better, best scenario. But I remember thinking what is going on, but my body and brain were reacting exactly the way they're designed to, yeah. to the, those processed ingredients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Anything, any other stories you want to tell about? No, I mean, it just same thing for you. It, 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 as you experienced every time I ate the process stuff, uh, you know, when it came to um, anything, whether it was through a drive through or a store, or I made it at home, or it was manufactured in a box, I was um, totally taken out of life, totally taken away from yeah. relationships, totally taken away from, from the sunlight of the spirit, as I call it. Um, and I was irritable. I was irritable. I wanted to figure out how I could get more. I was consumed mm -hmm. with consuming. <laughs> Very, I, I, I have never heard you use that term before. I was taken out of life, mm -hmm. but man, that sums it up so well. I mean, that's right? it. That, yeah. that little coined phrase, I will not forget that. Mm -hmm. So sadly, we know that our brains powerfully reward us when we eat sugar, fat, and salt. Thus, we have obesity 
and an epidemic of obesity related illnesses. Statistics tell us that 1.6 million Americans die every year from diet related disease. Food is the number one cause of preventable diseases. These are optional statistics and it makes me sick. Mm-hmm. Also, it draws the correlation between organ disease and the mental effects that impact our well being. Let's not skip over the depression, poor health invites. Oh my gosh, it's inevitable. Yeah. Have you ever known anybody that has suffered from diet related disease and how it's impacted them mentally? Have you yeah. seen organ. that connection? Yeah, organs, yeah. right? Organs, the brain, like the organ. Yeah. <laughs> the brain is, is our most dynamic organism or excuse me, organ in our bodies. It changes mm-hmm. from the minute, the minute you ever heard the expression page. If you ain't growing, you're dying. Mm-hmm. That's related to, that's related to the brain and body, the changes that happen in our brains until the, the moment we pass away. Mm-hmm. That is because the brain is constantly processing, constantly making new neural connections. So when we have diet related diseases, it impacts us mentally in in deep ways, I've coached people for years and I see the way the addiction has a hold on them and affects every aspect of their lives, but they're in denial about it. And it's not mm-hmm. because they're bad people or because they don't deserve to know it's because they're in the world that is, that is telling you that it's okay to eat these foods and they're marketed everywhere. So they think that that's what they should be eating. Yeah. Wouldn't they, wouldn't right. It's something that I should be eating. Um, and I believe that processed food addiction masquerades as mental illness. And there are so yes. misdiagnoses. Um, mm-hmm. These conditions can be attributed to processed food use. You know, I've seen misdiagnoses around bipolar disorder, around borderline personality disorder, around um, you know some of the other you know depression and anxiety, some of the other more more mainstream uh, diagnoses. And I've even seen panic attack symptoms mm-hmm. that, that mm-hmm. are once you pull those foods out you will see a massive decline in, in the occurrence of panic attacks in the recurrence of depression and anxiety, and even some symptoms that look like and mimic bipolar. Oh, wow. Um, Wow. And it's really scary to think about the conditions, right. Are, are, are because of a chemical imbalance, they tell us, but the chemical imbalance, I believe in many, in many cases, not all, but many, is caused by the chemical imbalances in our brains caused by processed food consumption. Um, and if you overlay the chart of the increase in depression and anxiety and medical prescriptions and the rise in obesity, right? If you overlay the charts that they were like on the, on, on slides and you overlaid them, uh, you'll find the trend patterns match as right. far as historically as obesity increased depression, anxiety, and other you yeah. know, disorders also increased. There's yeah. no, there's no accident. It's directly connected. Yeah. Oh, no. I, I, yes. And we will talk more about uh, the connection between depression and obesity and physiological uh, reasons why that happens. But, you know, you and I both work together with people that are suffering from processed food addiction, and we're familiar with the mental anguish they go through. It's heartbreaking. It's devastating. It's the hardest addiction to break for obvious reasons. It's everywhere. It's in our face everywhere. And I understand from personal experience, the pain of not being able to stop eating when you want to. It's frightening. It's uncomfortable. It's a feeling of panic as if you're in a free fall. So all that to say, if you have that much suffering, it cannot be good for your body. Mm -hmm. Your body reacts poorly to that level of stress. And if you are fighting this long-term at some point, it's going to show up in some form or another, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, metabolic syndrome, obesity, pain in the joints, heart disease, diabetes. I um, heard a doctor recently talking about how some overweight people can come in and their markers are okay. Lab work is okay. And, you know, they're very prideful about, hey, you know, I, I, I know I'm overweight, but look, my lab values and everything mm-hmm. are fine. And this doctor was saying, that's great today come back and see me in 10 years for sure in 10 years, that will not be the case. So, yeah. So we just have to be aware and start making changes now. So that leads into optimizing nutrition can maintain and possibly even enhance cognitive functions known to be affected by aging, such as memory and processing speed. Evidence has shown that nutrition is associated with changes in cognition from before we were born 
into our old age. Cognition includes attention, learning, memory, and executive functions such as planning and reasoning. So there's a lot to unpack here. First, you know, the big question is, is it too late? Why are we even bothering now? The toothpaste is already out of the tube, right? <laughs> well, we're here to talk about the fact that it is never too late to change your risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, osteoporosis, never, never too late to make changes. Yes. Healthy eating can always slow down the aging process in the, in the cells, starting from your very next bite. It can slow down that Absolutely. process. It, and that includes the brain. It can slow down the aging process of the brain. Yes. Agreed. And you know, in the, in the years that I've coached and mentored people in this, in lifestyle improvement and health, you know, attaining health, when I work with a client, I will tell them, you know, you're looking, they'll be like, oh, I've got to lose this much weight, or I've got to overcome this lifestyle illness, or, or I've got to get back mobility around this area of my body. And I'll say, you're looking at the mountain. You need to just take yeah. your focus down and put it in front of your feet and just take one step. Like, don't look at yeah. the mountain. If you focus mm -hmm. on the mountain, you'll, you won't move. You need to just put your, your focus down right in front of you. What mm -hmm. can you do right now? You can take mm -hmm. one step and then you can take mm -hmm. another step. The same thing is true. So we think that we, you know, oh my gosh, we, we can't make these big changes because we're, we're never going to overcome the world of food and the world of addictive substances. Guys, I'm not asking you to overcome anything. All I'm asking you is on that next bite that you're taking off your fork or your spoon, have it be whole unprocessed foods. Mm -hmm. That's it. And then the next bite, whole unprocessed foods. And the next bite, whole unprocessed foods. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. We're not, yeah. I'm not asking you to, to, to cure your, to cure, you know, something that that's been plaguing you for years, as far as, you know, excess weight or, or, or maybe if your food addiction, I'm not asking you to, to put your type two diabetes into remission in one day. I'm not asking you to, to reverse disease processes that have taken years to progress. I'm not asking mm -hmm. you to do that. I'm asking you on your next bite on your next morning. Can you take a walk on your next you know, grocery trip, can you focus on, on buying fresh fruits and vegetables first? Mm -hmm. You fill your cart with unprocessed foods. Yeah. That's what I'm asking you to do. Yeah. And you have um, a saying that I really like from Dr. Rosen. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? Michael Rosen, yep. Famous. He's chief wellness officer emeritus now from Cleveland mm -hmm. Clinic. He's an amazing. And he talks a lot about um, saying that we are our own genetic engineers. Nobody's mm. changing our genes. We're the ones doing it. So we can say that the food is altering our genes, but we're the ones choosing the food. Yeah. So we need, if we make different food choices, we can alter our genetic destiny. Yeah. And, you know, another pioneer who, as a matter of fact, worked with Dr. Royce and Dr. Royce and hired him was um, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who's a known Cleveland Clinic cardiologist, you know, very, very um, well known in the whole food plant based world. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn talks about that genetics load the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. And he also talks one other thing that he says that I love. He says, you know, people think it's really extreme mm -hmm. to, to, you know, eat whole unprocessed foods, to not eat, you know, uh, the, the way the rest of the world eats or to, to, you know, bring your food places or to cook your own meals. He said, but I kind of think it's really extreme to lay on a table and get your chest cracked open and have your heart, your heart valves bypassed, but that's just me. And I, I was like, yeah, that's right. Isn't that? I, I, I put a, uh, one of our little videos out there about exercise the other day and somebody commented on there and said, you are messed up. And I just laughed back and said, you have no idea, <laughs> <laughs> but sure let's call that's them wrong up. yeah that's wrong I don't want to be right that's exactly right mm -hmm. so do you think this information would have made a difference on how we fed ourselves and our children if we understood all of this beforehand you mean before the 70s <laughs> yeah 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 uh, that's yeah. that one I, I do I do I was a child I was a product of that or I was a product of I grew up I was literally born I'm a Gen Xer I was literally born during this whole marketing boon and processed food boon. I was born right after, you know, the, the, the TV dinner and, and processed mm -hmm. food marketing had started taking place right in the, in the early eighties. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I was, I was 
part and parcel to the entire evolution of marketing and and processed food growth and how big tobacco shifted to become big food and how they literally captured brain cells of small children. I was, I was one of those Mm -hmm. um, that they were marketing to and they were shifting. Um, So do I think that it could have been different? Absolutely. I think it was a timing thing. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you add other complicating factors like, you know, childhood trauma and other, other uncontrollables. Um, It can really set, set anyone up for right. a, life, a lifetime of, of struggle. with yeah. These- yeah. And, you know, unfortunately education is a good place to sp- to start, but it does not always change behavior right. as evidenced by our obesity epidemic, as well as our drug problem. Science tells us that people rarely change unless they are in crisis mode. It has to come and from I, within. Yeah. And I knew this was a problem, but I was still lacking the understanding of how do I get out of this? I, that, that, so education is part of the problem, but also finding the support, support, finding the direction such as with us Mm -hmm. of helping people get out of it. So it's a dual problem. Yeah. And and you know what? I don't think I was reflecting on this as we were prepping this episode. And I don't think that it would have impacted more than 20% of the population. Mm -hmm. And I think that's high. I think it's probably mm-hmm. honestly under 5%, but let's just say it's 20% because there's so many factors influencing parents' choices today, not only their own their own um, uh, misunderstanding or miseducation, but there's also the fact that environment that these kids are, that their kids are in, in school, out, out in society, in, in their friend circles, social networks. And in the world, I mean, overcoming that as a parent without understanding what you're trying to overcome is almost impossible because I don't understand yeah. the problem. Right. So, you know, that leads into the next discussion. The next natural topic of discussion is where do I even start? And it's kind of goes back to what you were saying about these small doable changes, nothing big. Just what's one small thing I can do? Uh, even meeting with coaches like us, listening to our podcasts, finding a support group, surrounding yourself with people with the same goals, huge, huge. If you can find just everyday people that are moving in the same direction as you are and, and getting as educated as you can. What do you think? Yeah. Where, where, where do you tell people to start? Uh, good question. I I would, I talk about, you know, the mountain, right. I talked about that just a few minutes ago, small steps, small incremental decisions mm-hmm. add up over time. That's the only way to make big change. It's not mm-hmm. big sweeping, you know, decisions. It's little tiny incremental things, taking that first step and then following with another, another, and another. And it could be related to anything. It could be, I'm going to take an extra step today. I'm going to take an extra I'm going to make, you know, this, this one healthy meal today. And I'm going mm-hmm. to, I'm going to just stick to the unprocessed foods at this grocery store today. I'm not going to eat out this time mm-hmm. today. I'm mm-hmm. not, you know, those, those changes add up. That is you making a big change. It's just in the small decisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I have a fun little uh, trivia for everyone out there. I'm going to tell you what foods your brain actually loves. This is, so here's the list of things that your brain loves. Vegetables, uh, sugar-free things, fermented foods such as sauerkraut, kefir, kombucha, and yogurt, olive oil, and fish such as salmon, and then seeds, blueberries, spinach, and nuts. Do you feel like you're doing a good job of eating brain-loving foods, Jamie? Uh, Absolutely. In in the whole food plant-based world that I live in, yes, I do a pretty good job of that. I'm pretty proud to say. (laughs) Yeah, I think I do too. I, um, we love salmon here. We have it every week. I have spinach every morning in my shake with blueberries and flaxseed for my um, omega threes. The brain loves omega threes. I have a little yogurt and I tried uh, sauerkraut recently on a salad and it was fabulous. Just sauerkraut and diced chicken over uh, my mixed greens great. Mm -hmm. And, and I try to always get a few nuts in every day. So sounds like our brain loves us. Yes. And it's so funny because I, you know, every day I start my day with 
with a, a you know a seed mix of hemp and or chi, hemp and chia and flax and and I will do um you know either in a protein shake but typically what I'll do is a huge helping of steamed broccoli and some kind of grain like quinoa or a millet and I will have blueberries and it's so funny because my first meal is usually around lunchtime just because of my schedule and what works well for me and my dogs are crazy about steamed broccoli. And if, and I've posted videos, they're out there. They're out there on, on TikTok. You can see them on our real food recovery page. I posted videos of my dog eating broccoli. He, they both love it. I, we have a new puppy. That dog is hilarious with steamed broccoli. I was giving our older dog his broccoli florette today. And the younger one launched himself <laughs> crossways in front of the older dog and stole the floret out of my hand. That is hilarious. Oh my gosh. That's, that's how much, so funny. That's how much my dogs love steamed broccoli and I give them fresh blueberries on their food. Uh, I, I, of course I, of course I do homemade unprocessed food for my dogs. So uh, I sprinkle some blueberries on top and my little guy loves blueberries so much. He takes them out of the bowl and he brings them over onto the floor and he throws them in the air. Oh my gosh. Around and then he'll like, you know, kind of eat them a little bit. And then yesterday we were watching him do that and he threw it at his brother. <laughs> and he's just hilarious. Like they just all organisms love whole unprocessed food. Yeah. They thrive mm -hmm. on them. They thrive mm -hmm. on them. We'll see how smart your older dog is tomorrow when it comes time <laughs> for him to get his piece. So that's I'm sure I'm, I'm fascinated by your story today. I'm even more on the edge of my seat to find out what happens tomorrow. <laughs> See if that brain food is really making it up to the noggin. <laughs> exactly. He needs to keep one eye open. So we know that studies show that processed food diminishes our ability to regulate insulin and increase inflammation and oxidative stress. In fact, many studies have found that there are links between sugary diets and impaired brain function, and even mood disorders such as depression, food definitely can impact your thinking and even your mood. I, I think depression is inevitably in inevitable when you are deep into processed foods. Uh, okay. We know that as you gain weight, it starts closing off those feel-good receptor sites in the brain. Another way of explaining that is um, the pleasure pathways become downregulated. There are less options for you to feel good. Uh, there's less dopamine and we know dopamine govern our pleasure hormones. So luckily though, when we start losing weight, they will open back up as we get off processed foods and back onto single ingredient, ingredient foods, you will naturally start losing some of that weight and your baseline mood will reset itself. Science has uh, shown us that. So it definitely affects my mood. Hence, depression is close behind uh, whenever I'm deep in the food. I mean, there's nothing. There is an initial high. It's, there's a sharp spike in dopamine, but there is a dramatic drop afterwards. What do yeah. you think? Oh, absolutely. And and for me, uh, I was clinically depressed and and diagnosed as such by multiple practitioners, right? You know, my, my family doctor and then a counselor I was working with, I was given medication. Uh, and I thought it was just related because I was, I was, I mean, I'll be blunt. I thought I was sad because I was fat. Mm -hmm. I thought it was one related, one was triggering the other, but it wasn't that at all. It was directly related to the food. The food was inflaming my body and the food was inflaming my brain. There was no way for me mm -hmm. uh, to, to come out of that without changing the food. And it wasn't even about my weight right? So it, the weight was just another symptom of the inflammation mm -hmm. that, that was also triggering the depression and also the anxiety, because it was sort of this mm -hmm. fascinating thing that I didn't really understand um, how it was like, um, if one would go down, the other one would go up, right? If I was less depressed, I was more anxious. And if I was more depressed, I was less anxious. And I remember thinking th they would talk about treating it with two different kinds of medications. And I'm like, this doesn't seem right. Like there's something else here. If there, if there's really an imbalance in my brain, then there should be a way to balance my brain without having to take two different medications. It just 
it, that's when I started to realize like, this isn't, they're just shooting in the dark. They're just shooting arrows. Right. In the dark. Oh, they for sure. No idea how to manage this. That's not the real issue. And it's not a, a chemical imbalance that I was born with only. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Do I think that I, I have a dopamine deficiency? You betcha. You mm-hmm. betcha. I'm an, I am an addict through and through, and I look for, you know, excitement and I look for ways to, to numb. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that that might be in one of the contributors, but you can, as Dr. Esselstyn says, you can load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. Genetics, yeah. load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. Totally agree. I, I have the same genetics for the most part, right? I have, mm-hmm. areas, we know that low dopamine runs in my family on both sides, but guess what? There are so many of us in my family that have chosen to be healthy with our food and movement and these lifestyle, you know, um, uh, boosts that we talk about here and they don't battle depression. They don't battle anxiety. They don't battle obesity. They don't battle any kind of lifestyle diseases or illnesses. Mm-hmm. So that tells me very clearly that lifestyle choices really work. I agree. So agree. So as we finish up here, we're going to get into uh, a sobering topic. We, and really, these next few minutes, I'm just going to give you some information about a cognitive decline. So as we talk about, I don't know if you have heard about type 3 diabetes. It's a controversial mm-hmm. name, sometimes used to refer to Alzheimer's disease. It's a type of progressive dementia Strong links have been made between the two conditions, most notably that dementia may be triggered by a type of insulin resistance occurring specifically in the brain. According to the American Diabetes Association, aside from advanced age, having diabetes or prediabetes is the second biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Although a small amount of research found an increased risk of dementia with type 1 diabetes, the vast majority of studies have concluded that this link between diabetes and Alzheimer's is specific to type 2 diabetes. Studies show the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease among people with diabetes is 65% higher than uh, that of those without diabetes. In Alzheimer's disease, it appears a similar problem of insulin resistance occurs, but rather than affecting the body as a whole, the effects are localized in the brain, which this this is just gut wrenching information. Mm-hmm. In, in, in diabetes, this is very interesting in diabetes. If a person's blood sugars become too high or too low, the body sends obvious signs of the problem, behavior changes, confusion, seizures, but in Alzheimer's disease, rather than these acute signal, the brain's function and structure decline gradually over time. Furthermore, scientists determined that as insulin functioning in the brain worsens, not only does cognitive ability decline the size and structure of the brain also deteriorate. It's chilling. All of this normally occurs as Alzheimer's disease progressive. So, okay, here's some symptoms we're going to look out for with type three diabetes. You need to know these symptoms. Um, They're essentially the same symptoms of early dementia, which according to Alzheimer's association include Difficulty completing one's familiar tasks, such as driving to the grocery store, memory loss that disrupts daily life, challenges in planning or problem solving, confusion with time or place, trouble understanding visual images or spatial relationships, such as difficulty with reading or balance, difficulty joining or following conversations or speaking and writing, frequently misplacing things and being unable to retrace your steps, mood or personality changes. And then we understand that the primary risk factors for developing this type three diabetes is having type two diabetes. The risk factors for developing type two type two diabetes include, okay, listen to these closely, a family history of diabetes or metabolic syndrome, Mm -hmm. over 45 years of age, high blood pressure, excessive body weight or obesity, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and low physical activity. All of those not all of those, but a lot of those we can change or impact. So there's a good deal of crossover between measures that can help to prevent both diabetes and Alzheimer's. And here are the four pillars that really make a difference in um, helping to control or reduce uh, these this problem. So 
Follow a diet rich in whole foods and low in processed foods. Get ample physical exercise, ideally 150 minutes of cardio and strength training each week and mental exercise such as reading, creating art, doing crossword puzzles and other cerebral activities. Deal with stress, practice, practices such as yoga and meditation help. And then of course, enhance your psychological well-being by socializing with others and providing service in your community. So if you have diabetes and you are concerned about your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as a result, discuss your concerns with your physician. They may be able to fine tune your treatment and management strategies to help shore up your defense against Alzheimer's. Have we convinced you yet to start making changes today? (laughs) Jamie, do you think this information motivates you to be even more vigilant? Uh, it does. And, you know, I come from a family where both sides were, are impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, and it's such a sad thing to watch. And it's certainly something that weighs on me every day when I, Mm -hmm. when I think about not doing what I do, Mm -hmm. I think about, it's not, it's not about the weight. It's not about, oh my gosh, my my pants won't fit. It's, I don't want to, you know, (sighs) lose lose sight of who I am or I I know. It's so sad. I, I know I, I've seen that in family members where their cognitive cognitive decline has set in and it's 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 gut wrenching. It's very sobering, very sad. And I wish there was more talk about this diabetes three and the connection between that and Alzheimer's. So yeah. anything else you want to say on this topic before we go to listener questions? No, I mean, it really, we, we talked about the second, this last part of the podcast episode being a little bit sobering. And it is, but I, I guess I, I want to just share that it's, it should be very uplifting to know that you do have a lot of, yes. just like, just like cancer prevention, nothing right. is, is a guarantee, right? Even if it runs in your family, even if you've got, you, you've got the predisposition for these, these illnesses, it doesn't mean that it's a done deal. Mm-hmm. You have immense control on turning yeah. off these genetic markers mm-hmm. that can bring these diseases on just as much as you have control in turning them on. I agree. So it is not, it is not just given to us. It is not just a, uh, you know, a foregone conclusion guys. This is something that you have control to change. Okay. And you do that with every bite you take, every step mm-hmm. you make, you know, I'm going to start quoting a police song, but this is, <laughs> this is what you can do to care for yourself. And, and, and we've said it before guys, no one's coming to do it for you. Nope. Nope. The government's not going to do it for you. Nope. The food companies aren't going to do it for you. Nobody mm-hmm. is going to change the way you eat and move and take care of yourself, except you. Nobody right. is going to change the landscape for you to make a different choice. It has to yeah. come from inside you. Agree. Agree. Good note to end on. So we have a couple of listener questions. One, the first is, I am so tired after lunch. What gives? So uh, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? Yeah. So more blood flow, right. To mm-hmm. digestion, right. That's what, when, when your body is trying to digest all that the blood is going to your stomach and going, you know, through the digestive system. And so you lose that, that blood flow to your brain. Mm-hmm. So you'll get a little sleepy, but this is going to be, you know, if you've got a, a meal high in, in things that need to be processed, right. So you've got carbs and, and proteins and fats in large quantities or in very dense quantities, that's going to take a lot more power and energy from your body, AKA blood flow. And mm-hmm. you'll see a, a deeper crash. You'll also see a bigger crash when you have you know, a large, a, a big high after a meal, right? So when I would eat three donuts in a row, you better believe that I'd crash hard You're right. because my body was trying to process those, that food and the insulin spike, right? Um, was also something that was, that was very high trying to combat the blood sugar that was Mm -hmm. coming into my system. So the blood sugar spike, excuse me, from the sugar that was in my system. The one thing that I have found in now, I don't go eat three donuts anymore and I don't eat (laughs) large complex and uh, calorie dense meals, but in general, after any meal, if I have that ability, I will take a 20 minute walk or some type of movement, cleaning the house, Mm -hmm. picking it up, playing with the dogs, something to move after a meal, especially if it's a meal with a lot of fiber and I'm feeling really full, I will move. It stimulates blood flow to all areas of the brain and my body rebalances my blood sugar and my insulin response. And, you know, again, 
there's there's no meal that that Paige and I talk about that is that is leaning one way completely. Like we don't talk about eating meals of potatoes. We don't talk about eating meals of of, of all protein and animal products. We we are we are food plan neutral, but we're not extreme. So one, one thing that we talk about is well-balanced meals and we give you mm-hmm. lots of ideas here in the podcast. We have them all the time and, and we share recipes and other tips. Paige does an amazing job with her videos. Um, but really you, it, it, you can change the way that you respond to a meal, the way that you mm-hmm. react, react to a meal, not only with the movement, but also how you can compose your meal and you can look at your sleep. You can look at exposing yourself to sunlight, getting regular exercise, and then Paige, we we both know, and I I do too. We love our naps at Real Food Recovery. <laughs> we love our naps. I was talking with my friends this morning when we were on the bleachers, and and we're all uh, sixty to seventy uh, years old, and and well, I'm not quite sixty. I've got a couple months left, but by the time this airs, I will be probably. But um, <laughs> so we talked about our goals as we get older and I'm like my one goal every day is just to get a nap. That's at the top of the list. That's all I care about is getting my nap in. Hashtag goals. Hashtag uh-huh. goals. Yeah, life goals. As life goals. So we've got one more quick one. When should I start really taking non-processed eating seriously? If dementia doesn't start till eight or later in life, we kind of covered this already, but now I'm screaming this from the rooftop in, in cap, yeah. capital letters, bold letters. Now, right. now, now, right now, what you do today is what will show up down the road, literally right this minute, the next bite, start, mm-hmm. start taking uh, precautions for dementia, literally this second. Yeah. Yep. Couldn't, couldn't have said it best. Okay. Paige, thank you. Thank you yep. for the, the research you put into this episode. Thank you for the, the information. Guys, we know it was a science heavy episode. We gave you the disclaimer up front. We're not trying to scare anyone. We're trying to, to empower you. Yeah. Um, so so again, we are we are so happy that you're here. We will see you on our next episode of Real Food Recovery. But in the meantime, make sure that you leave comments, questions, any kind of topics you want us to cover. Put yeah. that either, either in the comments or the show notes on YouTube here. Or if you're listening on any of the podcast platforms, you can find us on Real Food Recovery, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and uh, and on YouTube. So look forward to seeing you guys next time. Real Food Recovery. Bye, Bye guys. guys.